Kanupiam, welcome to Tomaquag Museum's virtual Native Women Author Series, sponsored in part by the Washington Trust Company and the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts and donors like you. We are commemorating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and Native women leadership, advocacy, and matrilineal histories that inspired the women's suffrage movement. Today, we are featuring Elizabeth Hoover, who is an Associate Professor of American Studies at Brown University, where she also serves as the Faculty Chair of Brown's Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative Steering Committee. Elizabeth descended from Mohawk and Mi'kmaq communities Focused, uh, most, focuses most of her work on food and environmental justice for Native communities. Her first book, The River is in Us, Fighting Toxics in a Mohawk Community, uh, published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2017, is an ethnographic exploration of Akwesasne Mohawk's response to Superfund contamination and environmental health research. Her second book, Project in Progress, from Garden Warriors to Good Seeds, Indigenizing the Local Food Movements, Exploring Native American Community-Based Farming and Gardening Projects. The ways in which people are defining and enacting concepts like food sovereignty and seed sovereignty, the role of Native chefs in the food movement, and the fight against fossil fuel industry to protect heritage foods. She also recently co-edited a book, Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the United States, with Devin, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Mahesa. Um, Elizabeth has published articles about Native American food sovereignty and seed rematriation, environmental reproductive justice in Native American communities, and tribal citizen science and community-based participatory research. She will be sharing about her work, books, and life through her restoring cultural knowledge, protecting environments, and regaining health book talk today here at Tomaquag Museum, or I should say virtually here at Tomaquag Museum. Welcome to Elizabeth Hoover. We are so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. All right, so we're all trying this for the first time, folks. We are going to try sharing my screen. So while she's finding her screen, I just want to say to everyone, thank you. Um, and I hope you're being safe at home, uh, practicing social distancing, which is, of course, why we're doing this virtual book talk rather than this book talk at Tomaquag Museum to um, make sure that everyone can get this information while staying healthy and safe and caring for their loved ones. Okay. Are you all seeing my screen now? Yes. Good. <laughs> Thank you for your patience from everybody. Isn't this fun? Okay. All right. You're still seeing my screen? Yes. Great. So, hi, everybody. As Loren mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about restoring cultural knowledge, protecting environments, and regaining health. So this is going to bring together two projects that have already been published and then one that I am currently working on. So, oh, there we go. So the, the book, as Loren mentioned, that is already published is The River is in Us, Fighting Toxics in a Mohawk Community, about Akwesasne Mohawk people and their efforts to combat environmental contamination and restore health there in that community. And then also this edited volume um, that I was fortunate that Devin Maheswa invited me to help her work on um, called Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the United States, Restoring Cultural Knowledge, Protecting Environments and Regaining Health that brings together a lot of different authors that I will tell you about later. And then I'll also tell you about From Garden Warriors to Good Seeds, Indigenizing the Local Food Movement, which is a book that I am currently working on and may actually get some progress on since we are all stuck in our houses right now. Um, so just to give you a little roadmap of where we're going in talking about the Akwesasne Mohawk project, um, I'm gonna talk about some of the environmental contamination, the sources there, the health research that happened, um, and then the way that the community really reshaped 
how environmental health research is done in Native communities um, by structuring the studies so that people got their results reported back and this then impacted other health interventions um, and then some ongoing food revival projects. So I like to, I started the book and I like to um, start talks in this area by thinking about the Haudenosaunee creation story um, or a very, very condensed version of it. So basically, um, and again, this is a, a super condensed version, but everybody was living in the sky world at one point um, and the, the chief, his wife, um, fell through a hole. There was a, a tree in the center of the sky world and he uprooted that tree and she peered down through and fell down through this hole. Um, and she's plummeting toward the watery dark world below. The animals look up and they see her coming towards them rapidly. And so the geese went up to catch her in their wings so that she wouldn't be falling down so hard. The turtle offered his back as a, a place for her to rest. And then the other animals got to work in trying to bring up some sediment from below this whole watery world. And it was the muskrat who ultimately um, came up with a little bit of mud in the palm of his hand. And so she spread that on the back of the turtle and she danced around and, and made it bigger and made this turtle island that, that we live on today. And she was pregnant when she fell. And so after setting up the, the whole world, she gave birth to a daughter who in turn became pregnant and gave birth to twins. And one of the twins came out the way that babies are supposed to be born. And the other one came out her side. He was very impatient. Um, she died in the process. And so then Sky Woman buries her daughter, as you can see in the picture in the bottom corner there. And from her body sprouts all of the important crops that people um, came to really rely on. So corn came from her breasts. And this is why corn is milky when it's in its green stage. Um, squash came from her belly button, and this is why squash vines are very curly and look sort of like umbilical cords. The beans came from her fingers, and this is why green beans kind of look like fingers when they were growing. Um, the potato, and there's you know Jerusalem artichokes and other kind of Indian potatoes that are indigenous to this area, came from her feet. And this is why if you're walking around the dirt, if you look at the bottom of your feet, they look kind of like potatoes. And the strawberries came from her heart and tobacco from her head, and this is why you burn tobacco to have a good mind. And so I open with this story just to demonstrate um, the sacredness and importance of women's bodies and the connection between all of these important foods that people have relied on for a long time and women's bodies and the land. And so that picture in the upper right hand corner was taken years ago. Um, now there are dozens and dozens of girls who are part of this program. This is the Ohologo Rites of Passage. That's a clan mother named Louise, who's in a red dress in the back there, but they're standing by a Mother Earth garden that they plant as part of the rites of passage as a way of you know, reminding girls of how sacred their bodies are and the connections between our bodies and, and having that good healthy food. So Mohawk, the Mohawk Nation, the Ganyakahaga is the um, oh, word for Mohawks. We had lost you for just a moment. Okay. Uh, just as you were pronouncing a word in your language. Okay, so uh, to start over on this slide here, this is a, a map of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy or Iroquois. Um, and the Mohawk word for Mohawk is Ganyagahaga or people of the, the flint, people of, kind of these hard stones. Um, and so the map in the upper right hand corner shows the traditional territories in what is now known as New York State. Um, the, the other map shows where Mohawk communities are now. After the Revolutionary War, everybody got kind of shoved up north by settlers coming in and, and taking everything and burning down cornfields. So the community we're going to talk about today is Okwizesne, which is that red dot that's right on that river, um, right at the most northern part of New York. So another element that I talk about at the beginning of the book that structures things in an important way is the great law of peace, the Guyana Lagoa. And so all of those communities that you saw on the previous slide at one point were not part of a confederacy. There was a lot of war and death and disease and unhealth. And so the peacemaker came and went around and talked to everyone and said, you know, to bring people together to demonstrate that people were more powerful together than 
um, as these separate warring nations. And so there are the three kind of important elements of the Guyana Lagoa, which is Scana or peace, which is in a tranquility. It's the end of bloodshed. You know, it's the absence of war, but it's also on an individual level um, to its health and soundness of a body and mind and spirit. Gasustansala or power um, is obviously, you know, security in numbers and people wanting to come together and form a confederacy so they would be powerful. But on an individual level, it's also that life energy force that animates people. Um, and so you need a strong, healthy society to enact the peace in the first element. And then the third element, the good mind or good word, Ganigan Leo or Galileo, um, is based on ethical teachings, value, righteousness, um, justice as formulated in customs of the people. And so these three elements together create the great law of peace. And that will come into play later when the community is thinking about how to structure um, the, the types of research protocols they want people to follow. And then as part of this too, I want us to be thinking about food sovereignty. Um, there's an international peasant organization called La Via Campesina that in the 1990s really started championing this term, food sovereignty. Um, and they had a number of different meetings, including this one in Mali in 2007. And they came up with this declaration and defined food sovereignty as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. And this obviously, this ability to be food sovereign can be impacted by environmental contamination. And this photo here, this is Kenny Perkins holding a ear of Mohawk red bread corn that's in the green stage. And then in thinking about indigenous food sovereignty specifically, because it's a little different perhaps in some indigenous communities than other state communities, but recognizing the social, cultural, and economic relationships that underlie community food sharing and that need to be nurtured. So there's a real focus on uh, relationships, the sacred responsibilities to nurture these relationships to land-based food and political systems. Um, so Native people have said, well, we don't just want any land to produce food. We want our land specifically and to be able to take care of that land and all of the communities on that land. And these kinship, these communities are really thought about and demonstrated through the Ohando Galikwadekwa, or the um, Thanksgiving address, the, the words that become before all else. And so this is a, a long prayer. If anybody's been to Haudenosaunee gatherings, you've probably heard it as something that opens and closes a lot of gatherings. And it takes time to recognize the, and give thanks for all of the different communities. So for people, for plants, for birds, for fish, for trees, um, for the sun, for the moon, for the earth. And so all of these different elements, people take time to give thanks for and to recognize in kinship ways. So you talk about you know, the grandmother moon, the elder brother, the sun, and recognizing the interconnectedness and importance of that. And so the part of it, because we're going to be talking a lot about fish as part of this book, um, there's a section in there on fish that we turn our minds to all the fish, life in the water. They were instructed to cleanse and purify the water. They also give themselves to us as food. We are grateful that we can still find pure water. So now we turn to the fish and send our greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. So again, thinking about our obligations to the fish, the fish's obligations to people um, and to the environment. And so this circle in which everybody has to take care of each other, that again is broken when people contaminate that environment. So this is a map of Akwazesne. It shares borders with New York State, Ontario, and Quebec. And um, when I was giving people in the community drafts of this book to read, they specifically wanted it worded that way. So the section in yellow, New York State considers to be within its jurisdiction. The section in pink, um, Quebec considers to be within its jurisdiction. And the section in purple, Ontario considers to be within its jurisdiction. But Akwazesne says, no, we're a, a sovereign nation. Um, and there are signs along Route 37 or have been letting state troopers know they are no longer in New York State, but they've entered a sovereign nation that happens to share borders with New York State. Um, but as you can see, that green line through the middle there is the international border. When it was put in place after um, the, the Revolutionary War, 
people there were told that the border would go uh, eight feet over the head of the tallest Indian. It wasn't supposed to interrupt anybody's lives. And uh, quite the contrary, it is very disruptive. And so it's, you know, to get to the Cornwall Island portion of the community, you have to drive over a bridge and go through customs and, and show documents. And it's a pretty big aggravation. The St. Lawrence River there, the gray band that also uh, passes through the community. In the 1950s, um, they decided to make that into the St. Lawrence Seaway in order to make it so that ships could go from the Atlantic up into the Great Lakes, as you can see on that little subset of the map there. Um, and this was very disruptive to the community. It also uh, built the Moses Saunders Power Dam upstream from the community, which provided cheap hydroelectric power. And so those red circles on the maps are different um, industries that then thrived on that hydroelectric power. And as you can see, the industries are very close to the community. So this is a, a picture that I took from my friend Gina's front yard on Cornwall Island, back when the General Motors plant was still intact. Um, as you can see, it's, it's quite close. And then the Reynolds Metals is about a mile upstream. And in the 70s, there was a lot of, it's an aluminum smelting plant. And so there was a lot of fluoride emissions coming out of that factory that then settled on Cornwall Island and decimated the dairy industry. So the cows, their teeth started falling out, their bones were breaking, um, and it took vets coming up from Cornell University to say, well, it's because of all the fluoride that's landing on the grass, that's in the water, it's in the air, and they were being exposed to a lot more uh, fluoride than people expected. And so there, since they've now put scrubbers on those uh, factories, but it the, the dairy industry and the farming industry and that part of the community never rebounded. So this is an aerial view. You can see the General Motors uh, site is very close to Akwesasne. It's right on that border there and then Reynolds further upstream. And so PCBs turned out to be the, the biggest problem in here. Um, PCBs is a, a category of chemicals. There are 209 congeners. Um, they're manufactured in different mixtures. So RCLAR1248 is the mixture that was used um, at the General Motors plant. Uh, possible health effects, cancer, endocrine disruption, immune suppression, neural behavioral abnormalities. They bioaccumulate and biomagnify, meaning the bigger fish that eat the smaller fish have even more PCBs in them because you store up the PCBs from the smaller things that you're eating. Um, they also move around, kind of migrate from the site. So that uh, green circle there that you see on the General Motors site there is a, a landfill. And so what was happening was General Motors, up until the point where PCBs were banned in the 70s, was using PCB-laced hydraulic fluids in their machines and their equipment. And then they would flush out these fluids, they would put them in wastewater settling lagoons right there on the edge of the river. And then the sludge would be dug up from those lagoons and put into this landfill. Um, and as part of the process, you know, the lagoons were overflowing into the river. They started leaching out because it's an unlined landfill. And so in 1983, it was discovered that these PCBs were migrating away from this site um, into the river and into the, the Akwesasne Mohawk community. So there was some concern about, well, if the PCBs are getting into the river, are they getting into the fish? So Gudji Cook is a Mohawk midwife from this community. And at the time she was at school in, um, and, and taking some classes and had been reading about the impact of PCBs on puppies when um, dogs had been exposed to this. And she became concerned about the, the women in the community that she had been delivering babies for. She was starting to notice more birth defects and was kind of alarmed by this. And so when she heard that the PCBs were getting into the river, she went down to the New York State Department of Environmental Contamination and asked for help in testing the fish so they would know if their food was contaminated. And as you can see from these different newspaper clippings here, um, so I was very fortunate that when I was doing interviews in Akwesasne, um, the chief at the time, uh, Mr. Ransom, had collected all of these uh, fantastic newspaper articles over the years, and he gave me this giant scrapbook. And so some of these clippings are from that. But as you can see um, from these headlines here, 
it was coming back that the fish had higher levels of PCBs than what you should be eating. So the um, USDA at the time said, don't eat anything that has more than two parts per million PCBs in it. Anything over 50 parts per million is considered toxic waste. And some of these fish had up to 30 parts per million. They found um, turtles that had 3,000 parts per million. Um, so these poor turtles were kind of hazardous waste that was walking around. And as you heard from the earlier story, turtles are really important to this community. Um, and so it was really considered an affront when the turtles themselves were also considered toxic. And so then once um, it was determined that yes, the fish that people had been eating in great quantities had PCBs, Gudgy became concerned about the, the highest people on the food chain, the babies, um, and whether they were being exposed to PCBs. So should she be recommending that women be breastfeeding? Um, and so she went to the Department of Health for New York State and they collaborated with the State University of New York at Albany and did a, a, a trial breast milk study. Um, and as you can see from these headlines, they found that yes, women who ate fish had higher levels of breast milk or PCBs in their breast milk. And as women um, cut back on their fish consumption, then the levels of PCBs went down. And this was an important initial study and it grew into many, many more studies because as part of it, um, the, the women who were part of the study and Gudgie herself said that, no, we're not gonna run this like other kinds of health studies have been run. Um, you're not gonna send white guys in lab coats to go collect breast milk from these women. They trained Mohawk women to go and collect these samples from other women, um, people that these women would trust. And so that was an important element. Um, and people got their results sent back to them. So this is Gudgy. Um, she started with her career kind of starting the Women's Dance Project in Minnesota. And the book talks about her kind of path in becoming a midwife. Um, when she got back to Akwazesne, she started the Mother's Milk Project to test breast milk to see if you know, women's breast milk was safe. And then that turned into the first environment research project. So as you can see this painting from Sherelle Tahi here, which um, demonstrates how the first environment that people are exposed to is in the womb. And so it was important to them that, you know, thinking about how do you protect babies in that first environment? How do you make sure that it's a safe and clean and healthy environment? And she now works with other women in Akwazesne as part of the Gunungwe Council, um, providing advice to the, the tribal governments on policies to protect women and children and families. So a big part of what I was interested in as part of this project um, is community-based participatory research, or CBPR as it's often called. So what made um, the research that came out of this project that, that Gudji and these other women were working on in collaboration with the university um, was again the way that the community had direction over how this these projects were going to go and was there collecting samples and collecting data. So SUNY Albany, the State University of New York at Albany um, applied for and got a Superfund Research Project um, grant and this went on for many years. So what had started with you know testing the breast milk then went to testing the blood of other people in the household um, and then looking at a number of other kinds of studies over the course of many years. So the first environment research project was the group of women. There's one fellow in the picture there, but um, from what I've heard, it was mostly women for the, this, as part of this team. Um, he didn't like drawing blood, which was something that they had to do as part of the, the research. And the Akwazesne Task Force on the Environment is a grassroots organization in Akwazesne that helps to bring together people from all of the different tribal governments. So because Akwazesne is split by the um, international border, there is a tribal government on the southern half of the community, the St. Regis Mohawk tribe. There's a tribal government on the northern community, the Mohawk Council of Akwazesne. And then there's also a traditional government, um, the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs. So because there are so many governments there, the Akwazesne Task Force on the Environment was a way of bringing people together from all those different entities and providing a voice for the community and advocating for um, the best environmental cleanup. And so all of these different organizations were working together on these health studies. And often, you know, if there are any researchers or, or lab students that end up watching this, 
Um, when you do a research project, you have to go through your university's um, IRB, the Institutional Review Board, and they determine whether your project is okay to carry forth. They make sure you're not going to harm any of your human subjects. And what the Akwesasne Task Force on the Environment was saying was, well, but nobody asked us in particular. You know, people just sort of came up wanting to do projects. And so they developed a good mind research protocol based on the elements of the great law that I described earlier. So um, of, of peace and, and the good mind and strength. And so in thinking about peace, um, there'll be peace between the, the researchers and the community if there's mutual respect that's upheld um, and thinking about how to maintain a good mind if there is equity between the groups. And so as part of that, you know, thinking about when grant money comes in for these projects, making sure that some of that money was spent in the, the community, not just um, down in the labs and um, empowerment. So making sure people got their results back and also all of the papers that were published based on these research projects included Mohawk authors, included people um, who had helped to collect the, the data and analyze that data alongside the scientists. So there were uh, over 50 papers, articles that came out of that research um, that you know, examining how the exposure to PCBs impacted people's health. Um, they found higher rates of diabetes for people that had higher levels of PCB in their body, um, higher rates of heart disease, decreased thyroid function, um, lower testosterone in male participants, the timing of menarche or when a girl gets her first period was impacted. So girls that had higher levels of PCBs had an earlier first period. Um, there was some slight uh, impacts to how well people performed on cognitive and memory tests. And then a part of a more recent study on ovulation. Um, so it was harder for a woman to have a regular ovulatory cycle if she had been exposed to PCBs, um, which impacts a woman's ability to get pregnant and carry that baby to term. So one of the things that I was interested in talking to people about um, as part of this project, so I went and lived in Akwazasne for about a year and you know, interviewed everybody that would talk to me basically about how this had impacted people's lives. And about three quarters of the people that I talked to um, when I asked, you know, did these different fish advisories that were passed after the research came out impact how much fish they were eating? And most people said yes, that they had dramatically decreased or entirely ceased eating local fish. Um, for some of them, it was after the fish advisories were passed that recommended that women of childbearing age and, and young folks not eat local fish. Um, so some people who weren't even in that category, so I don't know, often men would stop eating fish because their wives weren't cooking it or they assumed like, well, if she can't eat it. Maybe I shouldn't be eating it either. But people were also noticing changes in fish or had relatives who were uh, fisher people who told them about noticing uh, physical differences in the fish. Um, you know, a few people that I talked to said that they kept eating fish because they felt a cultural obligation to it. So if you remember earlier, the elements of the Ahandu Velimodekwa that talked about um, the role of fish and the obligations to fish. Um, one man that I talked to said, well, if the fish keep offering themselves up, if I say no and I don't eat them, um, they're going to go away because that's what happens when you don't appreciate something. There was concern about the cultural impacts of not eating fish. Um, so if kids weren't going out on the river with their grandparents, they weren't learning um, how to tie the nets to, to catch the fish. They weren't spending that time with their grandpas. They weren't learning the words for the fish and textures of fish and specific names for them. Um, so there was concerns about what would that mean socially to not be spending that kind of time. And so this leads to the idea of environmental reproductive justice that Gudgie developed as part of her work. Um, so in thinking about environmental justice or, you know, the, are people being exposed disproportionately to environmental harms? Um, and then also thinking about reproductive justice, you know, the ability of women to have babies or not have babies and raise those kids in safe, culturally relevant environments. Um, and so bringing together those concepts 
Gudgy developed this idea of environmental reproductive justice or ensuring that a community's reproductive capabilities are not inhibited by environmental contamination. And as you saw in the previous slides, um, if people's abilities to ovulate regularly are impacted, if people's testosterone levels are impacted, then that's going to um, inhibit people's reproductive capabilities. But then also considering the impact of environmental contamination on the reproduction of knowledge and culturally informed citizens. So if you have to raise your kids like suburban white kids because they can't be out on the land and catching the local food, that's also um, impacting uh, reproduction in a way. So part of what I was interested in, again, um, in talking to people who had been part of all these different health studies was this process of community-based participatory research. And especially the, the last box there, or the dissemination of findings. Um, what was it like for people who were getting their results sent back to them who had been part of this study? So I also, um, in addition to interviewing 63 Akwesasloana or people from Akwesasni, I also talked to seven different scientists at SUNY Albany who had been part of this research to find out what that process was like for them. Um, for the community members that I talked to, some were happy that they got their information back. Um, I hope everybody can still see me okay. So some, you know, the community members, some were happy that they got their information back. Um, some didn't really understand what it meant um, and wished that the papers had explained a little better. You know, there was like, I don't know what these terms mean. I don't know what these chemicals mean. Um, and part of it too, was that when I talked to some folks, they were like, I just want to know if I'm going to get cancer, if I'm going to get sick. And unfortunately, that's not something that science can tell you just based on um, your results or, or your levels of, of PCBs in your body because it impacts everybody so differently. Um, when I talked to the women who were part of the first environment research project, many of them found the job um, to be challenging but very rewarding. Um, some went on to continue to have jobs in labs or other healthcare fields. <clears throat> when I talked to the, the scientists, um, many talked about how they learned a lot from having to negotiate with the community and that they thought in the end they got better results because people who might not have taken part in the project did because it was people from their own community who were at their door asking them to take part in these studies. Um, so the scientists talked about also having learned as part of this process and carrying that learning forward into their own work and in their, their next round of studies they're working on with different communities. So one of the suggestions that people had um, when I asked, okay, if you, know, you could do things differently for the next round of studies, um, what would you do? And part of it was around like, well, letters went back to individual people. Um, there were big community meetings that um, were not terribly well attended at the time. And some people suggested this idea of family meetings. So, um, you know, as one woman said, well, this is how we convey information here. We get together, not as a whole huge community, but in our family groups. Um, and so thinking about how do you target the social body rather than just individual bodies when you're going to get information back to people. Um, and so this is a, a sociologist here, um, Professor O'Neill, says we must insist then that the family should be a thinking body whose common sense should be fostered in any health community and by any practical means. Um, and so this has also come to apply to other kinds of health interventions that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so when I ask people Okay, so you know, what do you think is the main health concern in the community right now? Now that you know, I'll talk a little bit about how a lot of the contamination has been cleaned up, it's still a concern, but what is the most pressing health concern? And the thing that most people said was diabetes, as in many, many, many native communities, unfortunately. So about a quarter of the community is diabetic, according to the folks that I talked to who run the diabetes program. Um, some people in the community think this number is much higher. Um, it's really impacted them heavily. And so part of, you know, for many the average Americans, it's like, okay, if you are supposed to lose weight and change your diet, you need to, to go on Weight Watchers, you need to go on the Jenny Craig program. Um, but it's about you as an individual. And what people were saying is, well, that doesn't really work here because um, eating is such a social activity. So everybody eats together, 
there's the birthday dinners and the Sunday dinners. And, you know, when radio bingo's on, everybody gets together to eat. Um, and so you can't just say, okay, we're going to target one person at a time who may be diabetic or pre-diabetic and get that one person to change their diet because it's not going to work in a place where many people um, consider eating a very social activity. And so thinking about how do you get the entire family to work together um, in order to keep in particular that one person or everyone healthy. So this idea of kind of social bodies or centering, bringing people together for health care um, also influenced the centering health care, the centering pregnancy program that was developed here for a while. So rather than women going through pregnancy and going for their prenatal visits as individuals, the program brought together cohorts of women um, who could then support each other. And you know, the women maintained their own charts and took their own blood pressure and weight and had a better understanding of you know, the ways their, their body was maintaining and changing. And if one woman was on her first pregnancy and another woman was on her third pregnancy, um, they could get advice from each other and create a, a community. This is also applied, I mentioned earlier, the um, Rites of Passage program, Ojologo. Um, this is from a few years ago. As you can see, the group has grown quite exponentially, but this uh, was, put together as a way of kind of centering adolescence. So often adolescence can be a, a very challenging and trying time for young people who can feel very alienated. And so this was a way of reviving some of those rites of passage ideas and creating this healthy cohort of young people um, who are learning about language and culture and food and how to be um, healthy adults. And they kind of go through this program together. And then uh, in the springtime, there's a, a time when the first years will fast for one day, the second years for two days, up to the, the fourth years go for four days. And then they all come together at the end for a uh, kind of welcoming back into the community and a celebration. Now, one of the concerns that people had um, and, and still have to some extent are that there are fewer farms and gardens in the community than there were um, in the past. And so this is a community where people said, well, we didn't even know the depression was happening because everybody here grew their own food and they didn't even, um, weren't even impacted. And so some people felt that it was concerns about contamination that had diminished a lot of the farms. As I mentioned, the fluoride settling on the island had really destroyed the dairy herds. Um, but then also, as I was talking to people, it wasn't just the contamination, but there were a number of factors that led to um, far fewer farms today in the community, including increased participa participation in the wage labor market. So people said, well, you know, farming is really hard work. You don't get any days off. You don't get any, you know, good health care um, to do those things. You know, if I have a nine to five job, I can, I can do that and it's easier. Um, some people talked about the cost of upgrading technology and the inability to procure loans. So in many reservation communities, it's hard to get banks to give you loans if they can't seize your farm if you don't pay that loan. And so that made it difficult for farmers to compete with off-reservation farmers. Um, there's concerns about, you know, people said, well, where my grandma's farm used to be now, you know, my siblings all built houses and then their kids built houses. And so there's concern about, you know, is there enough land to have the kind of farms that people used to have? And so the community has come together to work on some of these issues to support people that want to get back into farming and gardening and planting who might not have the space or the knowledge. Um, and so Gunahio was formed, I think about uh, 2004 or five, it's in the book there, um, as a way of supporting community members who wanted to come together and, and plant together and share tools and share seeds. So there's a greenhouse, you can see Elizabeth in the upper left-hand corner there planting seeds. Um, Jean and Henry had a chicken project for a while where they, they got the funds um, through Gunahio to um, set up the fence and buy the chickens there. In the lower left-hand corner, those are some kids from the Akwazesne Freedom School harvesting some white corn from the site. Um, so it was a program developed to support people and create community in that way. Um, also, Azajitawadu, or the Akwazesne Cultural Restoration. So as part of the Superfund process, 
Um, so after it was determined that General Motors had been leaching all of this contamination into the environment, it was declared a Superfund site. Um, and as part of that, there are a number of steps that the company then had to go through as part of the cleanup. But part of the determination is a natural resources damages assessment or figuring out um, to what extent did the, the local community suffered from not having access to these natural resources. But then here they also specifically did a cultural resources damages assessment. So how do you um, fix the fact that there wasn't all of this cultural knowledge transmission happening because people weren't interacting with the environment in the same way. And so Azadjidawadu has set up a number of programs where they hired masters, as you can see these elders up in the corner and others, who um, then worked with apprentices to teach some of that knowledge, like trapping and skinning and traditional medicines and farming and basket making. And there were language classes that were worked into this as well. So it was a way of trying to um, reclaim some of that loss that might have happened. And then the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment Division, which is sort of the EPA of, um, of Akwazesne there on the, the southern half, um, really is one of the strongest, I think, tribal environment divisions in the country because a number of people went and got degrees in different natural science fields and then came back to work for the community. And so here uh, you see one example, Craig Arquette, who's an environmental specialist there, um, who has been working on ensuring that contaminated sites in the area get cleaned up. And as part of the cleanup process, ARARs or applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements um, mean that for tribes that have an environment division, they can set their own standards for cleanup. So for the PCBs that crossed over the line onto Akwazesne territory, um, the tribe got to determine the cleanup and made it 10 times more stringent than the state and federal standards in order to be as environmentally protective as possible. And so here is the, the site of the area that, that needed to be cleaned up. Um, I won't give you the full rundown, but essentially the sediments in the river had to be dredged and the river was capped. Um, the people in the, the town upstream in Messina were very concerned that General Motors not close down because they were worried about losing job opportunities. Um, after the financial crisis in 2008, the government gave them billions and billions of dollars of bailout money. They closed down anyway, and so, um, and they declared bankruptcy, which meant they were no longer responsible for this and 80 something other sites that they had contaminated. So now, the General Motors that's back in the market and back in the game is the new General Motors. It's not the old General Motors, so they are no longer responsible for all of these messes. Um, they have an environmental trust that worked to try to get these cleaned up to some extent. But what that's meant is that this industrial landfill is still there, which people are not happy about. But the entire factory was um, leveled and taken away in rail cars, essentially. So now, after having dealt um, with General Motors for all these years and all the headaches, the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment Division is working hard to monitor another site um, on the Grass River from another factory there and is really kind of looking closely to make sure that the most rigorous cleanup possible is happening because, again, of all the experience they had previously with the other Superfund site. There's also a new fish advisory that the environment division developed. Um, so previously, as I mentioned, it was sort of like, just don't eat any local fish. And the assumption was that people, you know, they didn't trust people to kind of figure out what they should and shouldn't eat. And so um, the environment division got some funding and went and did a lot more nuanced testing of all the different fishes now that the, the river has been remediated to some extent. And what they found is that some are okay. Some you still want to avoid. Um, but there are some that you can have, you know, a couple of fish a month and hopefully not have your health impacted. And that also includes a map kind of demonstrating where they recommend people do and don't fish. So as I mentioned, the Grass River is a site they're still working on getting cleaned up. They don't recommend you fish over there, but there are other areas um, where they say that people can try to get some fish. So getting back to um, Garajillo, the, the group that I was working with, 
you know, while I was up in Okwazesne, I spent a lot of time hanging out with these folks and, you know, pulling weeds and butchering chickens and all the things that I had done as a kid growing up on a little farm in upstate New York. Um, and as part of that, you know, we'd often wonder, how are other communities doing this? How are other people getting youth involved? How are people getting funding? Um, and so as part of these conversations that I was having with folks here, I started going to all these different food sovereignty summits. Um, and then I got a notion to let's see, where's our, our map here? Um, I wanted to go visit all of these different groups that I started meeting at these food summits. So I got some funding, jumped in the car and drove 20,000 miles around the country. I was accompanied for part of it by a filmmaker named Angelo Baca, who took a lot of photos and uh, a video that he's going to work with at some point to create a documentary. Um, but I went to all these different communities, there's about 40 communities spread all around um, as, to, to ask people how they were navigating this farming and gardening and other kinds of food sovereignty projects. So as part of it, I developed this blog, Garden Warriors to Good Seeds, Indigenizing Local Food Movement, in part because people were like, I want to know what everybody else is working on. Um, but somebody has to, you know, we can't all just be driving all over creation. Somebody has to stay and actually plant the food. So this blog was a way of kind of informing people of, you know, what was going on out there. And some of the questions that I was asking um, the different farmers, and I was visiting specifically community-based farming and gardening projects. So the food sovereignty movement is obviously much broader than that, but I was interested specifically in farming organizations. And so some of the things I was asking them were about how they define food sovereignty or how they decide what is an heirloom seed and where they get their funding and you know, what kind of recommendations do they have for other organizations working on these kinds of projects. So the introduction of the book that will come out of all of this is currently tentatively titled, I don't want to hear your philosophies if you can't grow corn, um, which is a line from Winona LaDuke that she's often um, given as part of her talks, uh, which was something her father said to her when she went off to uh, graduate school. And so in thinking about um, the indigenous farming, gardening, food sovereignty movement, you know, how does it fit into all of these other food movements? Um, what are some, some practical takeaways coming out of, of this particular movement? Um, also thinking about the, the factors that have historically impacted native food sovereignty. So it's not just happenstance that communities today are really um, fighting to regain this food sovereignty. There were scorched earth battle tactics. So here on the, the East Coast, you know, first it was the French who were burning down Haudenosaunee cornfields, then it was General Sullivan during the Revolutionary War. Um, you know, George Washington told them to lay waste to their settlements and they burned, uh, you know, millions of bushels of corn as a way of trying to starve people out. Uh, there were relocations, so the Trail of Tears that relocated you know, thousands of people out of the Southeast to Oklahoma, um, the long walk that Navajo folks were subjected to. This impacted people's ability to um, continue to plant their crops and to feed their communities. The General Allotment Act, you can see that poster in the upper right hand corner, um, that took community held tribal land bases and divvied them up into individual plots for families and then sold the excess land off to settlers coming in. Um, boarding schools, which forcibly took kids off and, you know, they were not able to learn how to plant and gather and hunt from their families. So that impacted people's food sovereignty. Um, urban relocation in the 50s. So you had people who were sent to live in cities and didn't have as much access to traditional foods. Um, the BIA, especially in the Southwest, was really pushing farming methods and hybrid seeds. Um, which didn't do as well in desert areas as they did in other areas. So that impacted uh, communities' ability to keep farming. C cross contamination with GMO seeds has impacted people's ability to save seeds and keep planting um, and access to water. So there are a lot of different hurdles that communities have worked to overcome uh, to continue to be food sovereign. So the first chapter. Um, is based on an article that I wrote for the American Indian Culture and Research Journal called You Can't Say You're Sovereign If You Can't Feed Yourself, Defining and Enacting Food Sovereignty in American Indian Community Gardening. So as part of this project, I went around and asked people, how do you define food sovereignty for your community? 
and it really bent, was resting on the restoration of physical, cultural, and spiritual health, um, having access to culturally appropriate foods, the importance of relationships between people and each other, and then people in the land and people to the food, um, thinking about individual community, tribal self-sufficiency and control over food systems, um, economic independence, access to food, education. So all of these things uh, will be talked about in the first chapter. And then the second chapter is called Seed Sovereignty and Our Living Relatives. So because I was focused specifically on community-based farming and gardening projects, you know, seeds are a big part of that for many communities. Um, so in thinking about how do we define seed sovereignty specifically as part of the of food movement. So this is Clayton Brockopay here. He started the traditional Native American Farmers Association. And he talks about seed sovereignty as protecting our living relatives so they can't be molested, contaminated, or imprisoned. So basically they can't be genetically modified, they can't be patented, they can't be taken from communities. And then Rowan White, who has been a huge part of the um, seed sovereignty movement and the seed rematriation movement, talks about our inherent right to save seed and pass it on to future generations. So Rowan helps to direct the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network, which um, runs under the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And so I'll be writing about that as part of this chapter. So all of the different uh, seed exchanges and different classes um, and efforts to, to circulate heirloom seeds within Native communities. And as part of that, the seed rematriation movement. So the idea of getting seeds back to um, you know, from different institutions back to the indigenous people where those seeds came from as a way of connecting indigenous people to seeds, seeds to the land that they were originally developed for, and in the process connecting people to the land. The third chapter is You Are What You Cook, Native American Chefs and Gastro Diplomacy. So thinking about how Native chefs had, have started to come together to um, for multiple purposes. So to use food as a way of educating the broader public about Native people. So this idea of gastro diplomacy or, you know, educating people about Natives through getting them interested in food, like this is Sean cooking at the James Beard house. Um, so not generally an audience that would probably be thinking about Native folks, but he got the opportunity to get in there and, and talk to them and, um, you know, get them thinking about whose land that they're on. But then also there's a big push of native chefs gathering together to mentor. You can see the, the bottom there that the Great Lakes uh, Food Summit, there's an opportunity for senior chefs to um, mentor younger chefs as a way of, of getting more of this food into communities themselves. So making sure that indigenous community members have access to um, food and are excited about you know, healthy indigenous food. And so right now, during this time when everybody is stuck at home, a lot of these poor chefs, um, like people in the food industry everywhere, are really hurting. Um, and so I think some are going to start offering some online cooking classes, I saw. So definitely keep an eye out for that, how you can support some Native chefs uh, during this tight time. The fourth chapter is called You Can't Drink Oil. Um, so if anybody was at any of the protests or gatherings or actions, um, in support of people against the Dakota Access Pipeline. You remember the chant, you can't drink oil, keep it in the soil. Uh, so this chapter is thinking about the convergences of the anti-pipeline movements, the you know, anti-extractive industry folks who are trying to keep mines and pipelines away, and the food sovereignty movement. So thinking about how you know, foods have been held up as something more important than fossil fuels. So how do you keep um, these kind of nasty industries away from the land that people need to rely on for food. And so that bottom photo there is people planting a sacred panka corn in the path of the Keystone Pipeline as a way of further trying to prevent that from coming through. And then the fifth chapter um, looks at some of the successes and challenges in food sovereignty organizing and the ways that these communities have overcome some of these challenges um, and then the types of advice that they have for other people trying to um, get organizations like this going. So some of the groups that I talked to had been around for 25 years, some had been around for six months. And so looking at the types of advice that they offered for other people who might want to get started down this path. 
And then the conclusion um, is you know, looking at the growing movement of indigenous food sovereignty. So I was lucky to have the opportunity to go to the Uchpunka Corn Conference in Belize recently, and then the year before, um, the International Indigenous Corn Conference in Mexico. So looking at how indigenous people elsewhere also um, are struggling with a lot of the same things as farmers here and working to overcome those things. So as part of working on this project, um, Devin knew that I was working on this and thinking about food sovereignty a lot. And so she invited me to help work on this book, Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the United States, which was fabulous because it brings together a lot of different voices from people that you wouldn't ordinarily hear from in university press books. So we reached out to chefs and farmers and seed keepers and fisher people. Um, and so there's lots of, of interesting um, folks that you're gonna hear from here. So I'm just gonna give you kind of a, a brief rundown of what's in the book. Um, and then I would encourage you to, to pop online and, and buy that book. It's available on the University of Oklahoma website or your local bookstores. We've been telling people Birchbark Books in Minneapolis is one of my favorites. Um, they've been carrying it as well. So you can order from them online or um, stop in and grab it. The first chapter is called uh, Voices from the Indigenous Food Movement. And it brings together personal reflections from ethnobotanists and students and chefs and nutritionists and you know insect ecologists and lawyers um, all thinking about what food sovereignty means to them and how they got involved in this movement the the next chapter uh, is based on this article i mentioned previously you can't say you're sovereign if you can't feed yourself um, then devon has a, a chapter searching for haknip Ak Achukma. she will have to tell me how to say that better later um, but some of the challenges to food sovereignty initiatives in oklahoma so the, some of the political, economic, and social obstacles to creating and maintaining food sovereignty um, and the ways the communities are working past those. The next chapter uh, is from some of our fantastic Hawaiian colleagues about grassroots growing through shared responsibility um, that looks at some efforts to restore Hawaii's social ecological systems by concentrating on human relationships with each other as well as with the land and the water. And this is a photo from one of their events. Um, Ialupu, which means move forward together, is a network that focuses on creating, empowering community-based biocultural resource management under the umbrella of this backbone organization that they're writing about. The next chapter, Alaska Native Perceptions of Food, Health, and Community Well-Being Challenges Nutritional Colonialism, um, is by Melanie Lindholm. So looking at how you know, the, the challenges of the loss of subsistence lifestyle, how that's created a decrease in cultural knowledge and also an increase in metabolic disorders, but then also how Alaska Native individuals and communities have adapted to and are working against some of those changes. The next chapter is by Denisa Livingston, Healthy Dine Nation Initiatives, Empowering Our Communities. Um, Denisa works with the Diné Community Advocacy Alliance, um, and they pushed for the Healthy Diné Nation initiatives, also um, kind of more colloquially known as the Navajo Nation junk food tax, because it increased the tax on junk food and it reduced the taxes on healthy food in that community. So she wrote about some of the challenges and successes of that program, overcoming some of those challenges, um, including you know, how to define what exactly is junk food. Um, and then, you know, the focus on achieving a state of good health for tribal members. The next chapter is by Rowan White herself, um, Planting Seeds in a Modern World, Restoring Indigenous Seed Sovereignty. And it chronicles her journey of learning tribal food stories, learning how to plant and save seeds, you know, tracking down some of the different Haudenosaunee heirloom seeds, um, and then kind of threading through what she calls my trellis of hope and the earth apothecary. So it's a really beautifully written chapter. Um, she talks about seeds as life capsules of memory and then her work with the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network and the Haudenosaunee Seed Keepers Society. We have another seed person in there as well, Pat Gwynn, who helped to found the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank and he writes about what if the seeds do not sprout? Um, so you know, as I mentioned previously, the Cherokees were removed to Oklahoma back in the 1830s. Um, and so then there was an effort to think about where did all those heirloom seeds go? Nobody seemed to have 
access to seeds at that point. And so Pat talks about the journey of tracking down different varieties from Carl the Cornman Barnes um, to different Eastern Band Cherokee folks who provided with him seeds to some that were rematriated from different institutions like the Science Museum of Minnesota. Um, Dennis Wall and Virgil Masayesla, um, he's a Hopi fellow. This is a, a, a chapter about people of the corn teaching Hopi traditional agricultural spirituality and sustainability. So the different uh, methods that Hopi folks like dry farming have used over the years to grow corn in this kind of challenging environment. So thinking about the new unique relationship between Hopis and these different agricultural processes. And then Devon has another chapter in here, Comanche Traditional Foodways and the Decline of Health, um, thinking about what happens if your community doesn't have seeds to go back to, if you didn't have a farming tradition and now you're trying to revitalize your food systems. Um, and so thinking you know, some of the challenges around that and the health impacts of not having access to the kind of game meats that people did historically. Gerald Clark is an artist and a professor out of California, um, and he talks about bringing the past to the present, traditional indigenous farming in Southern California. So if you grew up in a community like mine, you think about farming in a very particular way. It's rows of crops, it's tractors, it's pulling weeds. And so Gerald talks about how that looks really differently for California tribes and the types of relationship that tribes had with plants out there, thinking of California as one big farm. So it might've looked like wilderness to Europeans who were coming in, um, but there was actually a lot of effort and work that went into um, crafting particular environments in the ways that they were. Devin Pena um, talks about on intimacy with soils, indigenous agroecology and biodynamics. That's him there with his giant head of greens. He must have very good soil. Um, because without good soil, you're not going to have a healthy garden. So he recalls his grandmother's relationship to the soil when he was growing up and how she tended to it and nurtured that soil. And then he thinks about all the different healthy microbial life and adequate materials and, and looking how, um, you know, the different types of, of words that people had for elements of soil historically. And then um, one of the last chapters is about Nephi Craig, who is a chef on the White Mountain Apache Reservation, who founded the Native American Culinary Association, as well as Cafe Gojo, um, which should be opening soon, hopefully, um, that is connected to uh, the Rainbow Treatment Center and part of the Nutritional Recovery Department there to, to help folks in recovery um, to learn how to cook and have access to really great food. And then Kyle White writes about indigenous climate justice and food sovereignty, food, climate, and continuance. So this is a, a great article thinking about, um, you know, the degree to which he calls collective continuance of indigenous peoples is interrupted by um, climate change and some of the challenges in maintaining relationships to the environment as it is changing dramatically and what tribes are doing about that. And then the conclusion includes some study questions so that if you want to use this book for a class or for a book club, there's lots of questions about each of the chapters there that you can refer to. So um, I recognize that because this is not a live audience, you're not really going to have the opportunity to ask me questions. So here is my email in case you watch this talk and you have any burning questions. I will try my best to get to them. Thank you very much. I think I unmuted. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. This was fantastic. Um, we thought since we don't have an audience, maybe we would have a little conversation afterwards and um, maybe ask a few questions. There were so many burning things that um, I felt were so powerful to talk about. But the first one that I thought I might ask you about just in your traveling across the country, because you went in depth um, talking about the Haudenosaunee uh, Great Law and how that community uh, intertwined their protocols in their action, community-based action research, um, uh, participatory research, I should say. 
Um, and I was wondering if you saw a similar trend across the nation where people were incorporating their cultural norms, philosophy, and values into the structural um, creation of their food sovereignty uh, programs, initiatives, and things of that sort. Yeah, so um, Navajo Nation has an, uh, has an IRB similar to Okwazesne, where if you want to do any research there, you have to um, go through that. But in thinking about the structuring of food systems, um, yeah, so this is, you know, a lot of communities that had heirloom seeds were looking um, to reconnect with those seeds. So we're saying, okay, we don't want to plant just any old plants in the garden. We want to make sure that these are culturally relevant and important plants. Um, there's efforts to get some of that food to elders specifically, um, you know, as a, a cultural teaching that people find to be important. Um, and just a real focus on rebuilding community. So how do we, um, you know, think about these different food projects as a way of bringing to people together out of this individualistic sense and more toward how do you feed your relatives, your community, your whole family? Um, so that I think was an important focus in a lot of the different food projects. Thank you. Um, I was also thinking about, I didn't know if you knew a lot about the Superfund project that's happening with um, Brown and URI and the Narragansett tribe here um, with Marcella Thompson and the Namas Fish Project. Um, kind of redundant because the word Namas means fish, but uh, um, <laughs> I, I was just thinking about that, particularly when you were talking about um, the shifts in communities of food consumption based on the uh, contamination in the water. Um, our, our levels of contamination, to my understanding, is nowhere near at the level of the river that you were referring to in Aquasasne, but um, it is concerning to our community that there seems to be this, un, this level of PCBs in, in the fish and in, in the water I, that can affect, I don't have the data in front of me as to how many pe uh, parts per million there were, but the idea that that is in the water that we're all consuming and that we're eating the fish and how that is shifting the way people are thinking about freshwater fishing here. So I was just curious if you had any more knowledge about that particular project. Yeah, I know that Marcella and Dina Lynn Spears over at the um, environment division there at the Narragansett tribe are working on a final Right up of that, um, Marcella had some health issues that really slowed down that part of the project, unfortunately, but she's still plugging along. She's doing all right. Um, so yeah, what they found was that there are um, some contaminants in those fish. Um, they didn't find that a lot of people were eating fish out of there. I think people are, tend to eat more uh, saltwater fish. Um, and so part of what Marcella was trying to figure out before she fell ill was kind of how the levels of contaminants that are in the fish weigh against the healthy elements that are in the fish. Um, but I would say, yeah, if people have access to other sources of fish, maybe uh, you know, deep pond and schoolhouse pond aren't the best places to go get your fish to eat, um, as long as there's still some available in kind of cleaner waters. Part of the challenge in New England and here is that there isn't an obvious source of where the contaminants in that pond came from. Um, it's not like, you know, in Okwazesne, it was very clear that General Motors was leaching this very particular mixture of PCBs, the RCLR 1248, into the river that was getting into the fish. Um, for a lot of, you know, legacy sites, they call them in New England, it's not clear where, you know, there's atmospheric deposition that can happen sometimes. Um, it can be leaching in from other inlets from other places, but that's one of the, the challenges there. My screen froze for a moment. <laughs> Hopefully they heard your answer. Unfortunately, I didn't quite hear it, but you don't have to repeat it. I believe Silver Moon said that she's still able to hear sometimes when my screen has frozen. Um, the, the 
Tomaquag Museum is also partnering in the Namas Fist project, more on the educational side. So we've hosted uh, community gatherings here to have talking circles. Silver Moon LaRose, who's also on this uh, Zoom, uh, led those um, talking circles uh, about maybe a year and a half or so ago. And we continue to do educational projects. They did um, some fish art projects here that were to help with the, the later as they do the report, um, a way in which to engage the community um, into the project in various ways so that kids can have activities that are connected to fish and fishing. Um, one of the things that always strikes me is our family um, very much spent a lot of time out on Schoolhouse Pond, uh, particularly fishing all year round, but particularly ice fishing. And I feel like that's when we had the most consumption of fish, because in the summertime, as you said, there's all the salt water access that we were doing. But um, as you can see, this year, there was no salt, no ice fishing happening. Right. <laughs> uh, but a couple of winters ago, we had a really strong winter, and there was quite a lot of ice fishing happening. And if you're fishing it as our cultures, um, understand if it, if, if um, the fish is giving its life for your life, that you're not just wasting it, you're eating it. So um, it'll be interesting to see how these results play out and what that's going to do in changing um, food ways and food systems here. Yeah. So um, not to keep you on here too much longer, but I thought I'd ask one more question. Um, and this had to do with, um, I mean, there were so many interesting things. Um, Katzi Cook and the midwife, um, I had read about her before, and that just so intrigues me and the work that she was doing there. Um, and so there's lots that people can read about in your book about that. Um, but the thing that uh, I was thinking of last was sort of the, the, the impact of health and wellness within indigenous communities, because this seems to be pervasive across um, indigenous communities across the nation and really across the continent and maybe across all of the Americas um, is the idea of, of diabetes and, and the idea of how dieting in a Western way of thinking is ineffective. I thought that that was really powerful and I wondered if um, maybe you would just uh, talk about maybe um, some of the strategies that you saw um, that were trying to change the the tide on on uh, diabetes and obesity and those other social uh, health issues, um, but doing it in a social group way. Yeah, one of the nutritionists that I talked to there in Okwazosni was talking about working with grandparents, trying to teach them how to make healthy snacks for the kids, but having to also work with kids because the grandmas would come and be like, well, the kid wants cheesy poofs. They don't want carrot sticks. And so, you know, getting the kids to understand that grandma doesn't hate you. That's not why she's trying to feed you vegetables because, you know, grandmas want to spoil their, their kids. But um, there's one great article um, by the Hayes Conroy twins and it's called veggies and visceralities or something like that. And part of what it talks about is that, you know, the foods, that most people are attached to in part come from because you have this emotional connection to them. So if your grandma makes you fry bread or fried chicken or um, lots of other you know, things that nutritionists would look at and say, this isn't healthy, this is bad for you. And you tell these kids like, no, this is bad. You need to eat this kale because it's good for you. Um, the kid is like, oh, my, my grandma loves me. Why would she give me something that's bad? Um, you're mean and this stuff is bitter and terrible. So why am I supposed to trade? Um, rather than, you know, what they recommend instead is how do you develop positive emotional attachments to this food? How do you get kids to have a nice time and then associate these new foods with a nice time? So Dream of Wild Health is this great program in Minnesota that takes kids from the, the Twin Cities up to the farm in Hugo, Minnesota, and they learn how to plant the vegetables and they take care of them and they pick them and they cook lunch every day there on site. And so the kids are learning how to cook, they take turns. Um, and so they're preparing the food that they took care of in the garden there that they have kind of this affiliation with. And then they also um, offer cooking classes for their parents and grandparents as well. And so kind of developing these sort of like, oh, I have a different relationship with this food because 
I'm with my friends and we're having a nice time and, you know, she helped cook it and I'm going to be nice about it. Um, so I think that's a big part of it is not judging people's food choices and trying to make them feel bad and thinking that guilt and shame is the way to get people to um, switch over, but thinking about instead, like, you know, instead of harping on get rid of this thing, instead you shift a focus to how do we incorporate, you know, having a nice time around this other food that will um, give you more vitamins and minerals when you eat it. You know, that's so true because I notice even in our own community, when we're going out harvesting, you know, which is very physical and very community oriented. So if we're cranberry picking out in the wild, you know, in the, the environment, it's such a family and community driven activity and your children um, are there all the way to elders. And just this past year, my grandson, my first grandson, Minaki Sumikwin, he was like 18 months old. So he has his first time going cranberry picking. And it was so fun to watch him pick berries, chew them all up and then spit them all out. <laughs> But to this day, he loves cranberries and cranberry sauce and cranberry things. And it, it's from that sort of experience of already doing that. And I can see your point of those social activities being such an important piece of, um, of the food system, whether that's uh, foraging or gardening or fishing or hunting it's all in our communities is done together so the more that we can do that together the more healthy we are i always feel so much more healthy when we're out in the field like that so well thank you so much elizabeth for um sharing with us i hope um people will go out and purchase or or use their fingers to do their walking and purchase um your books um I'm trying to see where you, uh, the river is in us, fighting toxins in Mohawk community and food sovereignty in the United States um, to um, learn more about the things that you were talking about. We'll be excited to have your new book out soon. Um, I don't know how soon, but when it's ready, we'll be very excited to um, read it and learn more about the work that you're doing. I thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And I hope everybody who would have come in today who is watching this instead, you'll consider giving a donation on the website. We really want to keep around important little cultural institutions like this because once we're allowed out of the house again, we're really going to want to have these spaces still available. So yes, please drop in and leave a nice note for Loren. Yes. And, and, and hopefully We'll be back on our normal schedule in May. We have a children's hour that's every Wednesday morning from 10 to 11. And when you were talking about that food systems and food gathering, um, our children's hour is intergenerational. So it's children of all ages and their caregivers. And we spend a lot of time out in the environment um, foraging and harvesting and planting. And um, last year, one of the activities that they did with Silver Moon is they actually uh, foraged for a salad and you know when when kids put all the things from the garden and from the landscape into the salad um, and then eat it they're very connected to it so we're we were very excited to be able to do more things this year we're very much focusing on literature um, as with these authors series um, that we're doing with women authors um, but we're also going to be featuring native um, authored children's book during our children's hour this year. Um, but I want to say thank you again to you, Elizabeth, um, for sharing all your knowledge with us. And I'm thanking the audience for um, watching our premier book talk for our Native Women uh, author series. So we're going to be having um, Deborah Spears Moorhead, uh, a Seekonk Wampanoag artist and author that will be in uh, April. Um, hopefully on site. If not, maybe virtually or maybe we'll postpone it to May so that maybe we can get it on site. Um, we thank you all for watching during this time of social distancing and we certainly hope you stay safe and healthy and join us for more virtual programming. Our staff is working on ways right now to create opportunities for kids and families um, and elders that are home to um, be able to participate in our programming and continue to learn about Native history, culture, the arts, and the environment, which is so integral to all of our lives. So um, 
We thank you so much, and we hope if you want to know more information about Tomaquag Museum that you visit our website at Tomaquag, T-O-M-A-Q-U-A-G-M-U-S-E-U-M.org. Um, we ha we'll have updates. Um, there is a resource button for teachers and families uh, for a lot of great resources that we have, everything from the First People's Road Tour to work that we did with PBS and with NPR that you can listen to audios and watch videos. Um, you can also check out all our social media, including YouTube, and maybe take some time and follow along and learn how to make your own dream catcher or corn husk doll. Um, all of those are on our YouTube page. So thank you so much, Katabatash. Um, and we so thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs>